human rights violations, okay? Welcome, CCF welcomes you. Um, first of all, I want to ask here, um, which countries do I have here? Uh, give me a shout. Do I have any Americans? Yo, Americans, okay. Do I have a British? Apart from me. I think he's just on his way through. I know there's one. Italian? There's one on his way as well. South African, I think we have a South African in the room. Yes, we do. There's also Holland on the way. So we do have a lot of people coming who are from different countries, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, Mr. Fieglin, I know that you're on a short period of time here, so what I want to do, uh, so, because I need you to see what I've been watching, and I've seen nine months of hell in this country that has traumatized me beyond belief. Uh, men, women, and children who are suffering in ways that they call it a holocaust and uh, I think I've probably seen more than most people in this room because I've been seeing it every day people have called me every day and it's been just one of the most horrific things I've had to live through in 2016 to be honest in a country that's democratic um, can I have a show of hands from anybody here who's had any dealings with the police oh can I have a show of hands of anybody who has not had dealings with the police just one or just one. Uh, any show of hands for people who've had a bad time with the social workers? Again. And uh, how many of you have been arrested? <laughs> how many of you have been to prison? Oh my goodness me. And uh, can I ask if you're all deadbeat losers who have no education and you're all bums? No hands. <laughs> Okay, um, I do have some mothers in the room as well. This is not just about fathers, but it is about mothers. So I think I have to say that if we were in the Eurovision Song Contest, would it be nil point or douze point? Uh, nil point for Israel's human rights and douze point for the abuse. What I'd like to do, uh, Moshe, if that's okay, is I just want to start you with a couple of people who've come from overseas. Dale, would you like to just come up? I know you haven't prepared anything and I will help you. Um, I'd like you to welcome Dale. He's come all the way from Sfat. I'll give you a little background on him. He's actually Barbara Streisand's cousin. <laughs> He's been trying for six, seven years to make Aliyah. He's never quite Jewish enough for Israel. They don't always accept him, but he's been persistent and he's finally got here. Um, he made Aliyah, they accepted him. He has an Australian-born daughter, or he did have, until when he arrived, the social workers decide they'd rather have her than he had her. So he hasn't got his daughter with him. And as a result of that, the social workers put criminal charges on him for Ali Moot, or violence, the usual thing. Yeah, we all know what that looks like. Because of that criminal charges, Aliyah was stopped. He has a wife and three children, beautiful children. His baby, little baby, is five months old. He's starving. He has no right to be here, no right to leave. His children are ending up with no rights, and he's in a desperate state. I'm going to give him the floor. He's not prepared this, but he's come an awful long way, and he's borrowed money, and I think he's very brave. Okay. You tell me exactly, Dale, what you wanted to say, because I know you've come all this way from SPAT for help. You're desperate for help. Okay. Let me just say, this man is very right-wing Zionist, religious, believes in his country. Well, he did, until he got here. And in the last few months, I've seen him change from, I love this, to, I think I might have to leave and bring my Jewish children up in a different country that's safer for them. Dale, put your plea out, okay? Everyone's, everyone's watching, okay? Okay, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> um, we were living in the Philippines, my wife is from the Philippines, and we were living on a remote island in the Philippines, and in 2009, we decided to, um, we wanted to come to Israel and raise our children, or our child, in a Jewish place, and um, we, we applied and we were denied, the Jewish agency didn't know what to do with us, so they kept handing us over to different people, it took about seven, eight months, and I was so upset for being denied, I just wrote letters from the Philippines to different newspapers here, and a couple papers answered me, and one wanted to do an article, and I did an article, it was Ha Eretz. I didn't know the difference of any newspapers at that time, and they called me in the Philippines, and, uh, and the headlines, Barbara Streisand is my first cousin, so that the, the uh, headlines was Barbara Streisand's cousins denied Aliyah. And I was raised in a Jewish family and all that, but I, uh, I took a bit of, 
of a side tour, detour, detour when I was, I grew up in the 60s in California, lived in India a long time, but I came back to Judaism in a very strong way, especially in Asia, and uh, uh, my wife is a giver, she, and very, very sincere, and we're denied. So anyways, a few people, about 40 people wrote to me, say, it's not fair, you, don't, you, know, you can't make Aliyah, there's people come to Israel. So there was one lawyer. Let me ask you just right now, what is your current situation okay. and what sort of mess are you in? Okay, well, uh, I have a, a daughter's going to be 16, one of my daughters. And I don't know if you have a teenager, but they're not the easiest to deal with. So my daughter, about two years ago, almost two years ago, she, uh, she was, let's say, acting up. And no one was in the house, and we asked her to do, I asked her to do something. I came in two hours later. She didn't do it. And so I wanted to see her phone because she was doing things she shouldn't be doing on her phone. So it was a bit of a brawl. You are such a sweet guy. You know how it is here, don't you? You know when you all get into your stories. I'm going to try and help you focus because okay, sure. time's short. Okay, your daughter was born in Australia, and due to a call and due to a noise, the social workers came and took her away from you. Am I right? Uh, pretty much right. And yeah. she's born in Australia. Am I correct? She has American and Australian uh, citizenship. She's born in Australia, yeah. So, that, so get to the bottom line is that um, they, it, it took a long time. They finally agreed, the Misrap Nim, to give us Aliyah. So when I went down to the Misrap Nim to get our pass, to get stamped, the man said the manager of the, of the SFAT office, and that, was a, that was a long story in itself, hey, said, you, you said you have a criminal case open. You can't, you can't, uh, Get Aliyah. I said, what are you talking about? We were approved. He says, yeah, you can't. But I said, it's not, you have to hear my side of the story. It's not fair. So we live, my wife's from the Philippines. She's from the country. We have four kids. We don't get a cent from, uh, from the government. Nothing. We, nothing. we have to live. So, it, it's so difficult. And we just wanted to come here and live and raise our kids in a Jewish way. And my, my, my children are speaking very good Hebrew now. It's almost three years. And it's one thing after another, uh, and my wife was worried because we have small children. Okay, Dale, let me just explain to you here that this man's made Aliyah, he has no money, he can't make Aliyah, he's not been fed, his eldest son has no rights, his wife is running out of rights, and soon he's going to have to leave because he's starving to death up in Spat. And now he can't leave because he has a criminal case. So like many, many people in this room, he's not a human being. He doesn't belong and he does not belong. He can't leave and he can't stay. And Dale's come all the way from Sfat to ask for help. He needs help desperately, desperately from someone in authority. And here we have someone. Is there anything else you want to add for me, Dale, at this point? Well, our first choice is to stay in Israel. That was, we, it took a lot to come here. We didn't get the red carpet treatment from Nefesh Benefesh, complete opposite. And we're here and we're, every day is a battle. You know, we had a nice property in the Philippines. We came here and we're living very difficult. And we just want to live here if, you know, get rid of this, expunge this case or whatever so we can live okay. like normal people. You're great. Listen, he wants to live here, but would you advise people to make Aliyah? Well, I would not, ad I would not advise. They, I think every, it's not such a blanket uh, thing. I think they really got to look into it and check everything out because it's not all cracked up with, you know, where it says it's going to We'll be. talk a bit later. S thank you. Isn't he great? Don't you think? Uh, the stories get worse. Um, Simon, 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 Simon. Where do you go? Oh, you're British. You're like me. And you're so polite like me. And you think like me that there's justice here. <laughs> Don't you? All right. You know how to... Uh, I, I can't let you tell your whole story because everybody here knows that there are lots and lots of stories. But let me just give you a background. Simon is British. He's not Israeli. He's actually a tourist, if you want to put it that way. But he does have a wife and children. Uh, he's trapped in Israel. He can't leave. And why is he trapped? And I'll tell you, he's trapped for future Mezanot. The thing that everyone tells me is not true happened to my ex. 800,000 shekel a head to be able to go and live his life somewhere. He's bankrupt, he's destitute, and also this lovely tourist got arrested for a false claim. Because uh, they don't just pick on Israelis, you know? <laughs> There's no discrimination. Let's pick on the tourists. Let's get them in jail as well. Hi, I'm not used to uh, giving speeches or, be or being in front of people. I'm Simon Satka. I came to Israel um, to have a Jewish family in to grow up here. Uh, I've worked hard all my life. Uh, okay. I've worked hard all my life, 
and um, uh, I gave all my earnings to the mother of my children, and she's uh, hidden everything, and when things got bad, uh, she called the police and had me removed. I was uh, thrown out virtually in the street, not understanding the language, uh, not understanding the procedure, um, question at 4.30 in the morning, not being allowed to make a phone call. I went to the Ravakha thinking, like, just like in England, that they protect the children because my, I was scared for the danger of my, ch my children. I've, be, I've been, I faced, I faced um, court cases. Can you work here? I have no. I can't work here. All my life, I've worked. I've worked uh, outside Israel. I was spending a week here or two weeks here and uh, working in Asia. Um, all my earnings, uh, my business collapsed through the 2008 crisis. Um, I came back. I have no family uh, to come back to as such. Um, Simon, how human do you feel right now? I don't feel very human. I've had to fight every single day, uh, being slapped from different courts in different, in different places, um, visitation arrangement cancelled. My youngest daughter is in such a state of parental alienation that it's been advised by the court that she needs to have a psychodiagnostic uh, analysed. Um, my wife, my, my soon-to-be ex-wife, is... Uh, refuses to agree to the process. Uh, tell, tell me, how does it feel to be taken by the police, treated like a dog, like a criminal, with no Hebrew, no help, and no understanding of the system? It's humi being humiliated to be taken in shackle outside Petr Tikva court. I've never hurt anybody in my life. I've never raised a hand to anybody in my life. And to be... Uh, to go through the cycle of not knowing, not understanding, and it's not a, not about a, about the truth or justice. Is from what I see is is how much connections you have. If you're well connected and you know who to turn to, you can get your way. It's not what you know; it's who you know. Okay, we're going to cut you short because I know the time's short for you. This just, one more, just my I've been fighting for four years for my children. I've been fighting for justice, and I'm here, not knowing anybody, is I'm not giving up on my children. Yesterday, in the Supreme Court, in the Supreme Court, in uh, a rabbinic court in, in Jerusalem, they're forcing her to get a get, and outside the court, she said to me, I have my family, I have the children, with a click of my finger, I can take the children away from you. And for all I care, you can jump out the window. And is this fair that I can't recover myself, start working, providing for my children, to be locked up here like a prisoner? My mother is sick in England. I can't go back because I need guarantees. And I even offered to give her most of the house and to pay all future alimony as well, but they refused to let me, she refuses to let me leave the country. We'll do you again, I promise. Simon, you see the trauma? You see the trauma? I, I hope you can feel the trauma of normal, regular people. Sion, I want you to just come down and talk to me for a minute. I'm going to give you guys a background on this. Uh, Sion's an uh, American born. Uh, his parents met Aliyah when he was eight, and he came to live here at the age of eight. Um, he left the country for quite a while and raised three children by himself in America and came back because he thought it'd be nice for his son to have a bar mitzvah, his big one to be in the army, and so on and so forth. Um, the rejection that he made of a woman who made advances at him resulted in a false claim to the uh, Revacha saying that his children were starving, they were um, barefoot, and they weren't at school. Ironically, your children were taken from school. Um, he's going to tell you a little bit, but I just want you to know that as of Friday, his American-born children, he cannot ever see them again, ever. No phone calls, no communication, they've been split, and his son told the world on a phone call last week... They took my dad, my sister, my brother, me, my heart, and they've broken me. 
and he is locked up with no computer, no phone, and nothing. And he's 13, denied a bar mitzvah. The rabbinut said, tough. You want to, I know how you're feeling, so go for it. Say what you want to say to him. Okay. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Um, yeah, as uh, Marian said, uh, my children were taken away a year and a half, a year and a half ago after making, uh, after being a uh, returned resident, Toshav Choser, and uh, from one phone call from a uh, a friend, a lady friend, not even a girlfriend, uh, the Revacha came to my kid's school in Jerusalem and took my children away. Uh, my daughter I've seen six times, uh, maybe for five minutes at a time in the last year and a half. My 13-year-old, they just disconnected me from him. Uh, he is, uh, suffers from epilepsy. The reason I came back to Israel um, after 10 years of not being here, and uh, these are children that I raised basically all their lives, but especially since 2008 when uh, their mother chose uh, drugs and a boyfriend, um, over her own children. I raised them. I finally came back to Israel in 2014. And um, by 2015, they were, they were taken. Uh, I was accused of alimut um, uh, Um Interesting enough, different than others, and not like the past, I have not been arrested and have not been brought up on charges. However... You are under arrest right now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I, I, before I continue, I just want to say to all the fathers, uh, be strong, no alcohol, no drugs, do not commit suicide, be strong, stand tall. Uh, this is our courtroom, and the judges and social workers have to know this is the beginning. The, you're, you're, you're on trial now, and we're not afraid of you, and we will stand tall. You, you have an urge to speak? Okay, uh, I'll let you speak, and then I'm going to ask you a few questions as well. Okay, so um, I'm going to make it short because actually I have 15 minutes, so you'll excuse me. Uh, I understand I, I'm, we're speaking English here. Okay, I was, not told, I was not told about that before, so but it'll be okay. Look... Uh, these horrible stories I heard for through all the years I was at the, at the Knesset. Uh, as you know, it's not my first meeting with the, with this problem, and many of the of the faces here are I don't see for the first time. But every time you hear these stories, it makes you uh, angry and frustrated and shaking again. Uh, so yes, it's good. Even though I asked to speak immediately, I'm happy I refreshed my feelings with, few, with the, these stories we just heard. Look, I want to continue from the point you finished. What was the name of the last? Zion. Zion. I want to finish with your words. Be st stand, stand tall, be strong, don't don't even think of committing suicide or, or, or do, doing anything stupid like that because there's hope, there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I did not come here at all to make any political campaign over here. And, and believe me, uh, uh, from the guys here in this room, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna win the election, okay? So I mean to what I say when I'm talking about a light at the end of the tunnel in this movement, Zehut, that I'm representing. And why I deeply believe that. There's a movement. You have to understand that your problem, the problem, you f the problem you're facing, is much, much bigger, wider than you think. You see, it's not about you guys. You are, you, you've been hit by the edge of the tail of a very big, I would say, uh, monster, okay? And this monster do not aim just to the avot grushim, to... to, uh, can, I, to can I speak with you at the same time, Moshe? 
we know that it's not just the regime. We know the corruption. We know the female lobbies, the feminist lobbies. We know that uh, poverty is absolutely astronomical. The black market's astronomical. And the whole country is going to fall on this because if there's no family in Israel, there's no f country. And if you break the fathers, the mothers, and the children, what's left? That's what I'd like to know. I think people here want to know what is left if you've taken their children, taken their dignity, and taken their freedom. Especially Kovitsia, the only country in the world that actually stops people from leaving. Okay. I, I think we believe the same thing, so let me just continue. Uh, and what is this monster? What is this monster is about, all about? It's about destroying identity, the whole world, actually, of society. There is a, uh, there's a war, a long war, very serious war, to every, against any basic construction of society. And the, ba and the most basic construction of society is the family. And if you want to destroy the family, you destroy the fathers. And it's always the same forces those who fight against any kind of identity, either it's a national identity, territorial identity, sexual identity, uh, uh, of course, family identity, any kind of identities that builds the structure of the uh, society, those forces that, that are doing their best to destroy this, use this structure, become so strong since the end of World War II and definitely in the last three decades and you find yourself suddenly standing in front of a monster that in a very unique way made its way to the court system, to the political system, of course to the media, to every serious intersection that counts. And why is Zehut is such a good, fresh message, fresh air, a light at, uh, at the end of the tunnel? Because Zehut see the whole picture. You see, we are not fighting for you guys. We are fighting against the monster, against the whole monster, and you're gonna get, and you and you're gonna have the benefit of it. We fighting against the court systems. Yes, not from not from today. It's not about another Knesset member that pro promised you that he's gonna change something in one of the laws. And of course, at the end of the day, gets when 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 if the law gets there, it has it also it already meaningless because it's not a part of a whole strategy that can fix the situation. It's about fighting the whole monster. Okay. We're talking, no, no, let me, let, me just, let, let, me, let me just, I'll explain, but I have to finish. It's about the whole monster. You see, when we're fighting against the justice system, it's not because of you. It's because, because the justice system started to be representing that monster. When we're fighting, uh, um, I don't care if you're left or right, guys, but when you're fighting for Amona, we're fighting against the same monster, okay? When we're fighting for any kind of Jewish identity, not religious identity, but any kind of national identity, when we're fighting, it's the same monster. It's Zehut, 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 Zehut. It's identity, 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 the national identity, the individual identity, the sexual identity, the family identity, and the ways to fight against the family are very unique. You see, family is, has a good name. Family sounds too good, family values. It sounds too good to fight against family. So what do we do? We say everything is a family. When we say everything is a family, then nothing is a family. So this is a fight from one corner. And where do you find yourself? Against the other side. Because what is the foundation of the family? What is the peer of the family? It's, of course, the man of the house. Why is the, through all cultures in the world, the name of the family goes after the fathers, not after the mothers. Why? Because the, the mother is the house, but the family is the father. 
okay? When you destroy the, uh, uh, the foundation, the concept of a father, when the man in a house become a danger, just from being a man is already an enemy, okay? By that, you destroy the family. It's not against you, it's, ag it's against the family. You're asking what is the monster? The monster are all these forces that are fighting against identity. And guess what? There's a movement today in Israel, a party today in Israel, that its basic name is Zehut, identity. And therefore, we're not going to jest. We're not just not going to jest. And, and, and God willing, we're going we're to get in the, in the coming Knesset with the very serious forces, Be'ezrat Hashem. We're going to do it, Be'ezrat Hashem. And we're not going to just pass a, 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 a little fixing in a little law that might help you somehow. No, this is not what we're going to do. And we're not even fighting for you. We're fighting against that monster. We're going to do everything. We're going to pass, of course, fix some of these laws, but we're going to fix the justice system. We're going to fix the whole, I the, the whole attitude to the uh, uh, concept of family. We're going we're gonna, to we deal with the whole disease at the same time, and not only with the... Um, Somebody has a, symptoms. Has a Thank you. Yes, please. Look, meantime, things are getting a little bit better. And why? The, 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 let me tell you, not that I think the things are better, but there is, you know, we start seeing some good signs. Okay? And I'll tell you what I mean. Did you see the Brexit in, in England? Did you see Donald Trump in America? What are these? Yes. Those are signs that the whole Western society are sick and tired of losing its identity. We're talking about the same things. And it's going to get here too. You're asking me what's going to be with you tomorrow morning? I'll be honest with you. I cannot help you tomorrow morning. I, can't, I have to be honest. I'm not even in the Knesset right now. Believe me, I know what you're talking about. It's even more, more than just the children. It's the whole society. It's the whole, the, the whole ability of our society, of the Israeli society, to exist. Okay? It's, 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 th this, is, this, is, this is what we're talking about. What I just wanted you to know, and I'll let you ask your question immediately, but I, what I just wanted you to know, that somewhere along the way, there is a very serious force that understand the problem fundamentally, okay? And going to deal with that, rather you'll join it or not, because we, believe, we understand in our, women and children, in our, in, women and men, in our, in our party, we're not going to do it because you organized yourself as a political force when you, and I want to get your votes. No, because, because it's our platform, platform. It's our ideology, because it's our fight against, of the, against of, uh, those uh, 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 forces who, dis who destroy the basic uh, construction of our society. Um, I just want to think that most people here can name the forces, which would probably be radical feminism, uh, feminist lobbies from America, Vizzo, Namat, etc., who make a business out of, or Shalom, who make a business out of child trafficking, child trafficking. Why is this different? I'll tell you why I think these people think it's different. First of all, Israel is one of the only countries funded by the world. 
it's funded for the right to exist. But I didn't know people only had the right to exist. I thought they should have a right to life. I also find that when we try to get help outside, all these people become self-hating Jews. They're not fathers, they're not mothers, they're not children, they're self-hating Jews. They're betraying Israel and they're trained here to keep quiet. So there's no chance for people, whatever party they have because the court system loves women, they're allowed to lie by law, the children are taken over and over. They are women, social workers are also women, hey, they don't get questioned. Uh, this country is in a disaster zone right now, and I'm trying to be polite because everyone here wants to say Shoah, Holocaust, and a disaster. So basically, I hear what you say, but the monster in Israel is different from the monster everywhere because you've trapped over a million people in here. They can't get out. It's the only country in the world you can't leave. Hotel California, what do you say the fact that you're holding all these men and women ransom and they can't even earn a penny by going outside? I don't understand. To this day, do you have anything you want to say about that? Look, those who follow uh, the Zehut party knows that the, con that the concept of freedom is the basic concept of, of, of our movement, of our party. Th this kind of nonsense will not continue once we'll have the power to, to change them. I can only promise you that. And those who uh, uh, followed me knows that I'm standing for my, profit, um, for my promises and I mean what I say. When we'll have the power, we'll, 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 we'll fight it and we'll change it. Sorry. I have one person, the last two, once. I have one more. Okay. I have one person who does want. I know your time is very limited. Uh, would you like to ask a question? One question. Please be polite. Please be polite. This has been uh, no, it's actually not a question. It's a story that happened to me today. Uh, my name is Moti Leibel. I'm an activist. Okay? No, 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 no. Guys, 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 please. Um, uh, today, I got a phone call from uh, a guy that made Aliyah last year uh, with his wife and four kids. Okay? And uh, his kids have some problems adjusting to the culture and schools and everything. So uh, somebody told them, listen, go to the social services, the welfare, and they're going to help you, you know, with, uh, even with uh, some money, help you with the uh, apartment, whatever you need. So they went to the welfare. And uh, since that moment, he, uh, their life became hell. Uh, they're actually pursuing them. They tried to lock up the kids, okay? So he didn't have any choice after a court that they have. Listen, they made Aliyah from France, okay? And uh, uh, Orthodox guys, real Orthodox, okay? And he called me today and he said, Moti, listen, on March this year, I took the kids and I took them back to uh, France. Why? He told me why. How can I close the case, how can I close the file against the welfare? How can I get them off my back? And I told him, listen, my friend, I'm very sorry. Me, myself, I born and raised in Israel, okay? I served my country, I love my country. Excuse me, but I hate the Knesset members, okay? They do not care from us. We are the small people. Hold on. You know what my advice for him was, okay? I told him, in these words, my friend, buy a ticket and get the hell out of here. Because if you, no, 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 guys, 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 you do not need to applause for that. It's a very, very sad story that a born and raised, okay, a Jewish guy in Israel is telling people to leave Israel. Okay, it's very sad. It cannot be. We are, my friend, I'm going to tell you something. We are smuggling people out of Israel, okay? People that are standing almost behind bars, taking the kids, put them in institutions, okay? Private institutions. Why? Because of money, okay? Like my friend said, child trafficking. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to you. Last thing before you leave. Uh, th th there, there are people being smuggled out. Lots and lots of people are trying to swim. Uh, there are people who are threatened not to come here today. Facebook is being closed down all the time. We know Homeland Security are trying to stop everyone speaking through the, through the government. Cyber crimes, people are arrested. Uh, what is it happening? No one's even allowed to speak. It's really frightening. There should have been three times more people here, but they're too scared to be here. 
Okay, I, I told you that when I started that I, I, it's not the first time I hear those stories. I, what I didn't tell you that I used to go and visit in jail men and women uh, uh, that are being in jail, jail for a long period of times, okay, and because of those reasons. Uh, the concept is very simple. Uh, we want the whole country, but we want as minimum as state as can be. We want a small state. We want a small government. We want a mi minor the involvement of the state in our private lives to the minimum that's possible. And therefore, <laughs> and, th and, therefore and, and, and really, I'm telling you, people don't understand that concept here in Israel. People think that the, the, the state is their fathers and mothers. The basically, the concept that the state come instead of the family is a communist, ultra-leftist concept, you know? Mother Russia, right? Mother whatever. The, in, 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 in the Stalin regi regime, a child that gave away his parents to the gulags was a hero. This is what we're talking about. A state that comes instead of the family. We're talking about taking the power from the state, giving it back to the community and to the family. And we're talking, and we're talking about doing that in all circles of life, in education, of course, in the economy, and of course, in any kind of family circles, giving back the authority to the family and, for the, and to the men of the house. We, without doing that, that, that these destructions, destruction uh, uh, um, uh, 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 movements will continue destroyed our society and we're not giving up on that. We're not giving up on that. We're not giving up on, our, on, our, on Israel. We're not giving up on our wonderful country and definitely not, not, not leaving it. But I'm leaving now because, as, because that was the deal and I have to run. Uh, I ju I ju I'll just tell you one more thing. Uh, I don't need you to fight for you. So that's, that's a good message. Thank you very much. Please, please, please tell all your friends that Israel is being sued and sued and sued from everywhere in the world. So, and we're going to keep on doing it, aren't we? Yes, we are, because there's nowhere else to go but outside. Oh, dear. Marigold, Marigold. Uh, how many people don't know Marigold's story? Okay, I'm going to just give you a tiny background on Marigold. Um, she's going to give you a nice bit of news. She didn't marry the State of Israel, although they think they did, that she did in America. Uh, she's a mother of twins who are now 10 or 11 years old. Um, and they were taken away from her two, three years ago, three years ago, on the grounds that they might be autistic or a little behind at school. You know, the usual um, excuses that they give. No tests were done, and those children have been held now for three years in the most appalling way. Um, I think there's a few people in here know that the social workers force children to lie. They force children to say things they don't want to say because they're scared. And Marigold's no exception. Marigold, do you want to say what's on your mind to the world, huh? My girls were raped in Edesim by a house father and two guides. One called Mayan, the other one called Owen the gorilla with the small one. Everyone knows what that means. If your girl tells you, mum, They'd hurt me downstairs, and they leave ugly stuff on my tummy with red in it. Anyone knows their child's been raped, and anyone has to believe their child. I believe my daughters until the end of time. In Israel, there was no recourse. No courts gave me any rights. So I went and did an international case. And just, them. just just tell uh, everyone here what the decision was in Oklahoma about your husband. The state of Israel is my husband, the father of my children. My case was closed on the grounds that it's only a custody case. A custody case. I didn't know that I slept with the state of Israel. I didn't know that they impregnated me. I didn't know that... That's it, but I've appealed, 
and I'm praying for my good news. My girls went, were taken by force to the judge in my case. She managed to threaten them to tell, to tell the, the judge that they want to stay there for another six months instead of coming home when they beg to come home. I'm going to hold this for you, just one second. Okay, that question in English. Let's name the judges for a minute. I just want to, I, I'll take that question. Um, I just want to ask you as well, because you're a criminal right now, aren't you? Yeah. Um, you've published pictures of your own children uh, for the weekend, which is not allowed, but they're publishing pictures of her children to raise money abroad as abandoned children. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? In the Vizzo magazine. Is it Vizzo? SOS, SOS Villages and Vizzo are advertising her children. This is a new lawsuit. Okay, talk about the treatment you've had in the Israel court, Marigold. I've changed. First of all, was with Tova Perry, the criminal ju judge of the youth court that has no respect for children's rights, that knows that they were raped and did nothing. I've had Galit Morvigotsky, who's also a criminal. After all, she allowed them to bring the children to work behind my back. She does not want to give me my children back. I have never had a fair trial in Israel. That's why I'm suing abroad. I believe in the justice system of the world, not of Israel. Israel it is all corrupt from the bottom to the top. Well said. Well said. The system is full of people. Full, full, full of people. The state of Israel is corrupt because the system is corrupt and it's full of corrupt people making money from the system, in the system against the ordinary people. If we want to separate it, bring it on. But right now we have to sue the system. Okay, and everybody in it that is committing the crimes against your children. That's why I sued them for trafficking in human beings. The state of Israel legally, state-sanctioned trafficking in children. Israel is a trafficker. Sad but true, Marigold. Okay. I, I, I'm taking testimonies of people first who are having uh, some problems. I have an international room here, and I think I have... Is Holland in the room? Do we have Holland in the room? Come on, you. Come on, Tim. Now, I don't know if many people know Tim, because he's kept himself quite quiet. And he's an amazing person. He's just too polite. You see, the Dutch are a bit like the British. We always think that if we tell the truth and we just do what we should and we're polite and we say please and thank you, then we get what we want. Does anybody know the name Judge Macias in this room? Oh, has anybody think she's an amazing judge or no? She's a criminal. But she's nice to Tim, just like Elia Noose is nice to Simon. Because uh, all the foreigners think these judges are nice, you know, because they say nice things. Tim, oh my God, hiya. Um, Tim lives in a field, basically. His seven million shekel house is down the road and he lives in a field. He built, a, it's beautiful, it's like a size of a car uh, garage, a car lot. But he's very good with his hands and you built it real good, didn't you? Do you want to tell everybody here what's going on for you? You're not an Israeli. I don't think you have a work permit. It kind of comes and goes a bit, doesn't it? Uh, Let's go for it, Tim. Tell everybody who you are. Hello, my name is Tim. Uh, I came before 16 years, uh, married, um, with a woman who had nothing, built up everything, built two businesses, built a house, and when everything was ready, she uh, just called to the police and said that I uh, hit her and that I have to leave the house. <coughs> I lived uh, four and a half months uh, just on the street. Uh, and house arrest, if I recall, yeah? Uh, we went to court for divorce and the judge asked for a polygraph because of uh, all the lies and out of the polygraph came that uh, she was lying. She was lying about uh, that I hit her. She was lying about all the things that she said. Still, uh, I didn't get any rights. Um, 
No, no, because she lied, not him, remember. <laughs> the judge did nothing with it, while the judge asked for the polygraph. And um, yeah, since then, it's five years ago, my, I had 23 hearings, uh, no, not one decision from the judge. Uh, the house is written on Tabo on my name and my ex-wife, uh, the Mascanta. Everything is on, written on both names, but there is nothing, uh, no decision. My last hearing was in January 2015, and uh, whenever I ask, uh, I just want to finish it. I just want to solve it. I want to go on with my life. Nothing is happening. In the meantime, she's only writing to the Misrat of Nim in Jerusalem that I am very uh, uh, aggressive guy and all kinds of things like that. Uh, before 16 months, I was in court in uh, Misrat of Nim in Jerusalem. Till now, no decision. 14 of October, I uh, went again to the Misrat of Nim. I got all the time for three months, my Todazut. And the last time on 14 of October, uh, the woman said, I can do nothing for you. So I, uh, I'm without to that zoot. You see, you weren't born to this. You were born in, a, in Holland, in Europe, yeah. what we would call in the other side of the sea, a free country, where we know that if we tell the truth long enough, a judge will listen, or we have an ombudsman, or we have somewhere to complain. But he's Dutch, and ha there are a lot of Dutch people here like this, aren't there, I hear? Yeah, and especially I met a few Dutch people already in the in the meantime, and uh, most of the guys uh, really suffer like crazy, or but are afraid to leave the house or say something to their wives because they see uh, my example. So they are captured in their house and uh, really treated like crazy. It's uh, unbelievable. I, I just don't understand that you can go nowhere, and really nothing is. I am not allowed to work, so I cannot earn money, but I have to pay me because I'm in the country. <laughs> I, maybe I'm too simple for this, I just don't understand. Uh, <laughs> my kids wants to see me, and I'm lucky that my ex is only happy if I see my kids. And if I then want to take them to Holland, and they are happy, and I get some money from friends, because my mother is in the end of her life. Uh, and somebody come to pick me up and drive to the house or where my kids live to take them and the mother say even, I wish you a nice week with your grandmother, I'm so happy for you and enjoy and please take care of them. And I come to Ben Gurion, we show our passports and she closed the border and my kids are crying on the floor and devastating. Just because she can. Yeah, just because she can. And she just say, it's not me. He, he did it. While the guy in Ben Gurion say, but it's written in, in in the computer that it's you. And I don't. I, I just cannot understand. I I understand she wants to divorce, and the judge say it will take a, sh a, sh a short time. I'm five years and nothing is moving. What? Why five years? What's going on that it's taking that long? I really don't know. <laughs> my, 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 my lawyer, uh, uh, just all Max time, Lipkin, all the time ask for hearings, and or her lawyer cancel it, or the judge cancel it, and it's uh, the, the, without any reason. And I, what I understand, uh, that if a meeting or a hearing is cancelled, it should be uh, that the, in 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 two weeks there should be another one. Not two years. <laughs> It's, uh, it, it's really crazy. So for all of those of you who are born here, we are going to give you some ways out of this hopefully soon. These people have come to live in your country and made children and businesses and they thought it was going to be okay. And you're born in jail, remember? You're born in jail. He's not. He's not born there. And he doesn't understand this feeling of no justice like you do. So understand for foreign nationals it's much more difficult. Is there anything else you want to add, Tim? Yeah, that's it. Uh uh, the accusations keep on coming. Uh, she, uh, she accused me from rape. She accused me from hating my kids. Uh, and, and we make a polygraph and she's lying. 
And then <clears throat> when I come to the criminal court and I come with this polygraph from the court, the judge uh, just said, uh, we cannot use this here. So she say, <coughs> did you do it? Did you did it? They said, no, of course I didn't do it because I have the proof here by court. She asked my ex-wife, did he did it? She said, yes. So she say, one say yes, one say no, what it is? Then my ex say, ah, listen, I have two witnesses. Suddenly two people stand up, two women. I don't know them. And they say, yeah, we were there. So I told to the judge, I thought that you just said that it's not allowed to lie in court. Can you take a polygraph now from them? She said, no, we don't do polygraphs. It's three people who say yes, one who say no. Wow, it just doesn't work like that in our countries. Um, can you imagine what this is like to sit here five years with a seven million shekel house? I think she sold your business as well, didn't she? Your half of the business for a shekel or two? Yeah, his half of the business she sold for a shekel. Was it a shekel or a bit more? No, I built two Ghana with my own hands. I did the driving, I did the hooking and everything. He gave us 120,000 shekel netto every month. Okay. I, I, I told her in the beginning, give me one year 10,000 shekel and I will build myself. And she said, no, you will live uh, like a dog on the street. And now she claims, and the house and everything, and she wants 300,000 shekel. Plus I have the proof that in the last 10 years, uh, before I left the house, she took around 7 million shekel of black money she put aside with her family. Black money yeah, from yeah. the walk, from, from the gun. And I have all the proof and it's in the court and the court just do nothing with it. And I have telephone calls that she, things that she say to me, everything. I send it I, and I have to pay all the money for this. I'm so proud of you standing up here. I know that's really hard for him because he's ever so shy. <laughs> and you found me and I said, don't go to a social worker. Uh, and we've managed to keep your child with you and your partner for now because you didn't go to a social worker. So nice one for CCF. CCF are doing the work. Brother Moses, do you want to talk for a minute, Moses? You never get your voice heard. I know it took you two years to leave the house. And I hear you're cooking. I know you've been accused of a lot of things over these years. Uh, this is uh, Marigold's brother. Um, you know, the whole family get hurt when there's a child taken, you know. Um, and somebody reminded me earlier today, where are you, that everyone in this room is a child. Everyone in this room has a parent. And they're also not knowing what to do for you, just like you don't know what to do for yours. And your parents could be dying in another country or dying here from the stress. And your children too. So what's happening to your parents? This is shocking. Right. What do you want to say, Moses? Can you manage? I'll hold the mic. Um, crying for the world to uh, help the people of the country because it's a really, really bad situation. With their situation with the girls, with the twins, and uh, with another 10,000 children. And don't forget, children, there is parents to them. So it's at least 20,000 people or 30,000 people that are getting into a very bad situation every year. And uh, tell, tell the UN something when they see this film. What do you want to say? Whew. Short sentence. Help. Yeah. That's short. <laughs> uh, I, just, I think everyone feels the same, yeah? David, we need to talk about what people can do. Um, because <laughs> Raphael, how many Raphael? I'm holding the microphone today. So how many Raphaels do we have in the room today? Because I know there's about 300 Raphael Rubin profiles on Facebook. Just Last year when I was here, uh, Raphael had um, contact set to visits with his with his girls. Uh, we'll say this for the camera. He was playing in the contact center as if they were at the beach because the mother had decided they couldn't go to the beach. So they all played swimming costumes, blah, blah. And he was accused of actually um, 
touching them and doing the wrong things because they weren't dressed. This is in a contact center, Merkas Kesher in uh, Hebrew. And so they kind of threw him out and told him to explain himself. Last year, Raphael went round with his violin, playing to anyone and everyone who'd listen, outside Chaim Katz's house and on the street and everywhere and everywhere. And you actually succeeded. I'll give you that. For your music, you did succeed in getting them out of the Merkas Kesha. Uh, one of the people, just again for the record for the UN, who played with him committed suicide this year. And he's one of many, but Danny Zaron committed suicide who played with you. Now, Raphael, you got your children back for a bit. And then the next thing I know, you're in a psychiatric unit when I saw you on Facebook. Okay, so that's where I'm getting at. So first of all, I just had a question about the contact centers. Okay, so there are uh, 80 contact centers in Israel? 64. 64. I think about 25% of all fathers are being sent there. The way there are, uh, although there are a very small part of the uh, entire judicial system, they are an essential, an essential part because they are actually are used as an alternative to uh, visitation rights, meaning that a, instead of actually cutting off the fibers uh, completely, they offer an alternative, but in fact, it is an alternative that allows to cut fathers officially. Um, uh, what happened? Uh, How is things for you now? What are you trying I, to I do? Think I've been cut off my uh, children, Avigail and Deborah, three weeks ago because I took a lawyer, whose name I won't say here, who uh, asked to uh, stop the judicial process with a judge whose name I won't say here. Say the judge's name, please. We want the judge's name. Uh, the judge is Tamar Snunit Furo. Uh, she did not allow uh, three psychologists who came to my home, Elena Tsarbakov, Tovi Pellet, and Paula Sadovsky, for 40 hours sat with me and my kids. She refused any of my witnesses, not one of my witnesses, and she also refused to make further uh, assessments, even though she actually condemned the original family assessment that was made. And, theref and, theref and thereafter, she actually invited this same uh, Mahon Shalem, Dr. Sherry, psychologist, to actually uh, come to uh, testify. And this uh, Dr. Sherry, a few weeks ago, asked to cut me off Obviously, I sued him, not obviously, I sued him for two million shekel in the courts before that, So, and, she, and the judge herself attacked him a few months ago. Okay, so Raphael, sorry to cut you because I know time's short, but I, you're from France, so we have another dual national here. Uh, I've met your mother, she's obviously in shock about this. Your whole life is about suing and suing and suing. Why can't you go live in Paris and just have a nice quiet life? Uh, I've come to realize uh, something very important in the last few weeks. Uh, for the last three years, I was fighting for every single wi minute with my kids and living under constant threat of being cut. And the mother obviously is not probably not sane because she, uh, any normal parent realizes the importance of two parents. Um, now, I've realized that instead of fighting for every single minute with my kids, mm -hmm. It is actually more, much more important that I should fight for my own self and let the judicial process that I have uh, committed involve and, and it will eventually lead to myself being sane and strong and also justice to be made. Well done, Raphael. Thank you very much. Okay. We're still doing okay for time because you've got a lot of people to help. I want to just say something nice, you know. Uh, this is a CCF conference. Hello there to you. Hello to you. Uh, we have another Italian in the room, another uh, European. CCF, the Coalition for Children and Families, we're doing this here today because there is human rights violations. We do have good news. Um, I've got half a good news story, haven't I? Um, Half a good news story. Simon, who's sitting here, is South African. Uh, Simon got caught up, not married, no children, but very much in the Atzala poll and bankruptcy. Simon. Russell. Wow, where did I? I've got Simon in my brain. Russell, Russell, Russell. How could I forget you? I know you're not human, but I should, you still have a name, huh? <laughs> um, we wrote about him and published it outside, and he got some support from France. As a result of that, he could use a CCF lawyer, and he's en route to getting out and sorting out his life. Um, 
There are a few people not in this country which uh, came from a little bit of help of CCF, but I probably can't talk about those too much. But yes, there are some people helped. Um, and there are some other people that have been rescued and saved along the way, which we can't publish often, but we do help. Um, wow. Uh, hello. Hello. You came all this way. You Italian person with your daughter. Is a Napoli. Is it from a Napoli? Ah. <laughs> Okay, um, I don't know where to start with this one for you, but I just need to cover it because we do need to move on to tell you how to fix these things or what we can do. Uh, hello. I came to you in Jerusalem and I videoed him. He's standing on the street praying and asking for money for his daughter. Um, not only have you been... Come here for a second, you dear person. You dear, dear man who has absolutely nothing to his name and is out there, and I'll use the word begging, for his daughter. Um, not content that the system bankrupted you, ruined you. There's no words for what they've done. Let's say that all the seven things at one, first of all, shalom, oh, it's over. My mic. My oh, mic. oh, it's your mic. <laughs> I'm not going to go back to the shop. I'm not that bad off. Anyway, uh, I'm Elia Ugal Or from Boshaw Modin, one of the founders. I'm here with my daughter Miriam, who is the daughter of a certain amount of corruption in the system, which we we'll, might get into details. I don't know how much time I have. Not long. You'll, Good. You'll get a bit of time later, but right. I just want you to basically say as an Italian, let me just cover something. He has a pension. You have a pension in Italy. Sorry? You have a pension in Italy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you go and get it? Well, uh, one of the things that happened to me, independent from what happened to my daughter, is that I was hit by Bitua Cleumi, with a debt of 300,000 shekels over the 16,000 shekels that was taken, not by me, but my ex-wife, without my ever being told for years. And I had a business in Italy, which went naturally to pause. We're talking about March 2010. I came to do Seder Pesach with my children, and I was stuck here. And every, I mean, I love being here 39 years. I have never been sorry for a minute, but I do also need to make a living, and here I don't. So you have a Yukov, it's a tough Yukov, you can't leave. I can't leave and I can't drive a car and I've been offered many good jobs which require a company car that they give me and I can't take those either. Right now my debt has skyrocketed to two millions and uh, among other things, there, there are some laws passing on in the Knesset but they keep on passing laws like that. So far as I know, like 20, 30 years that they keep on uh, shooting the crap, you know, excuse the language, and nothing ever, ever happens. The same thing I could say about legalization of cannabis. I have a broken neck, I'm in constant pain, and it's, I can hardly sleep, but I have been put through a gauntlet for over a year without ever getting a prescription. We can't do cannabis in this particular conference. Listen, stay we're with not, me. We're not talking, we're not talking about that. I just thought that okay, I threw it out as an example of the right. system. I could tell you a lot more. There is a man here named Mayor Green. I don't know if he came. I, I met him on, the, on Facebook. He's also very desperate because his wife has blocked him completely. Okay, okay. I'm going to talk to you in a while. It's very hard for people to get the stories out without a letter, you know. The reason he's here is because he's the dad. Actually, he's the dad of somebody who's in trouble. Aaron, did you want to say one thing before we move on or not? You're American. How many Americans did I say I have in this room right now? Um, are you aware, let me tell the UN camera, that there's a, a government warning on the American travel page warning Americans not to come here uh, because they may be held in vol voluntarily for long periods of time due to any domestic disputes they have. So what are you all doing here? You got the warning. I never got a warning from my page. Uh, and they still let me out. Um, Israel is signatory to all sorts of things which we're going to talk about, but it doesn't mean a damn thing. Um, <laughs> David, Guy. Guy, 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 guy. Come down. Okay, do you want to know what to do about it? Would you like to do something about this? 
great. Uh, you have no remedies in Israel. So just accept that you have no remedies. You can fight for years like Raphael, and you're going to end up at the end with nothing. You'll end up, you know, with nothing. For the most part, 99% of you won't win. I'm saving you for later, trust me. Uh, you won't win because we're going to cover the rights of the child. So why not fight from abroad? Okay. Let's see what we can do. It's over to the amazing David Weiss and Guy. Come here, Guy. Um, Guy's Argentinian, a little Argentinian. And you may not know him, but he was so dead famous here. It's unbelievable. Um, and he was, you were writing songs for stars and you were traveling the way. He even knows Simon Cowell. Could do with him as a, as a backer in Westlife and band. So he was a big shot. Uh, he's not now because he's homeless and he, I have an exclusive Hebrew video uh, that was banned by Channel 2, which is just sat in my email today, so you're all going to see it in the next couple of days. They followed you for three years, Guy. Uh, not literally followed you like you were a criminal, but you had the cameras for three years watching your decline to homelessness, yeah? Yeah, yeah the first homelessness. The first. He's been homeless so often. And he's going to talk in a minute about... Um, as an Argentinian, what, what's happened and what you need to do to be able to sue. And here with him, he's going to sit here and I'm going to stand there. This man is recognized as the enemy of the state of Israel. He is the number one enemy of the state of Israel. CCF are kind of like number two, but David, you've beaten us. He is amazing. He's registered in everywhere as the man to be careful of. Um, he has registered so many lawsuits against the state of Israel that you just wouldn't believe it. And he knows how to do it. And we're getting there. Yeah? <laughs> now, he's ever so good. And he's going to tell you how to do it. Not like how to win, because we haven't quite got to those places yet, but he's going to tell you how to do it. And we're going to annoy the state of Israel. Like a mosquito, we need to annoy the system, you know, with a fly and a, and a bee and a buzz, because we have to. Or they won't listen to you. They're just not going to listen to you. And some of you are very lucky that you're dual nationals and you can actually do it better. But we'll find a way to help the Israelis. Who wants to go first, you geniuses? You. Go for it. Go for it, guy. Hi. Uh, those who knows me or don't, those who don't know me, it doesn't matter. Uh, let, me, let me take you back to 1944. 43. Um, people were talking about something that happens to a community that uh, they are Jewish and uh, they are trying to take their life and their rights to live. Um, well, they were Jewish here in Israel trying to make some th politic uh, things, uh, but the answer didn't come from Israel. And our cases will not come the solution from Israel also. We're going to need all the world as we uh, needed them back in 1945. And also in the uh, Moses uh, in Egypt that we, we ask for freedom because also our rights were there taken from us. So this camera is more important than this uh, Knesset or this Havel Knesset that wants to be a Havel Knesset. Um, I'm here because I'm a Jewish. I, I'm not going to leave Israel even if I know how to swim. Um, I'm not going to live here. Uh, and this I'm going to tell this camera and every camera that you're going to put in front of my, fa my face. I'm going to fight until I get my rights back as a kid, not also as not, not just as a father. I'm a kid that asking for help. And uh, if I save my, this kid, I'm going to save my kid. And then I'm going to be a good father. Now, as an Argentinian, I realized that Israel will not help me. So I told my story to an attorney. Uh, in Argentina, and he said, look, it's too big for me. I cannot take it, but let me take it to the government. He took it to the government, and then they say, okay, this is not your case anymore. This is an Argentinian case. It's Argentina against Israel. 
So uh, I'm just uh, testifying in the in the case. I'm <laughs> Did everybody understand that, or shall I explain it again? Yeah. His testimony, and this is what he's going to really insist on how to do it, went to his natural country, and they have taken that case not as Gaital, but actually as Argentina, against the State of Israel for parental alienation. Um, now, this is going to The Hague, to The Hague, The Hague, however you want to say it. Right, now here it, here it is. This uh, Israel have until we know the end of February, January to respond. They have another three months. three months. They have three more months to respond. And then, because it's a democratic world out there somewhere, it's going to be televised from The Hague. So you'll actually see it. You'll actually see the case. Now in South America, many, many countries no, find... The funny, the funny thing, sorry, the funny thing is that I, I, I have to fly there to take to give my testimony in in face to face now israel will say that she cannot let me go out because <laughs> all of, so this is going to be this is going to be uh, it doesn't matter what they answer in the ktav um, uh, okay israel will write uh, this is the example living example what happens when you take a freedom of someone that didn't do some nothing nothing else just being a father. Just a dad. Now, in, in South America, I know that Chile, I think Mexico, other countries are starting to say that parental alienation is a crime. Uh, the, the, the Hague have been trying to make this a crime, and it is becoming a crime. I know that there's a country that I'm shortly going to, and I'm told that the ministry there are favorable to suing Israel for the people here. And I'm not sure yet whether it can be done, but I'm going to find out. And by God, if I find out that there's one country out there that will take all your files and all your testimonies, then we'll sue everybody's case for parental alienation. I hope that sounds good. But you need to do stuff. You need to do something for this. Listen, you're homeless. You're homeless. Yeah. How many times again? Three times. Three times homeless. Uh, you, refu you refuse Mezanot and you refuse the Merkaz Kesha. Is that the reason why you were made homeless? I don't refuse to pay Mezanot. I refuse to pay for my kids. I want to raise them, not to pay for them. <laughs> this is the reason. <laughs> and <laughs> now, uh, I told them uh, I don't care about the money. Uh, I care only about my kids. So if, if you stay Jewish, okay, and you stay a father... Keep on focus for me here, guy, yes, please. Yes, I'm trying. Um, um, if you fight for your kids and you fight for your rights of, of being a father, okay. and it, it, it can happen. It can, it right. can I've got to keep you focused, Mala. Yes, okay, what do people need to do to be able to give me and CCF and others... Uh, a case to take abroad for parental alienation. What is the difference between a story and a timeline? Just give two examples. Uh, first of all, you have to, to control your case. All the documents, the recordings, all the dates uh, have to be in A, B, Z, B, C, one, two, three. Uh, all the chronologic you need because other eyes, they need to, to see what, you, what you've been through. So when you have it in order, then it's very easy to see uh, what what really happens. I, and the translation, uh, I, I send all the um, or, or, ordinary um, uh, files, and they are in Hebrew. So uh, what Argentina made, they took a notary on and, and, and translating Spanish. with a stamp of of Argentina. Tell me something. Who who's your judge been in Israel, and uh, can you name your judge here? My judge? Yeah. Well, me, I don't care. No, but you've ha you have a judge in Israel. Yes. Tell me the name. Well, uh, she, her name is Doctor Varda Ben Shahar. Oh, okay. And <laughs> um, what do you feel about your judge? That she's not a doctor. 
She's not a Varda and she's not Ben Shachar. And she's maybe not such a good judge. Okay, listen, if you need help on how to make a timeline, he is your man. He really does know how to do it. And you've got to talk about parental... If any, does anybody want to sue for parental alienation? Please come to us at CCF, CCF. Uh, David, you're not the last but least because I've got a whole bunch of children's stuff to talk about before it ends. Sorry, Motti, we might be five minutes late. David... Okay, the enemy of the state. He's still alive. He's under arrest, and he came. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not number one. I'm not oh, sorry. And, no, and, he, and he came. He came. He came. Okay, yeah, go for it, Dave. Dave, all yours. I don't need to control you, do I? You can have the mic. No, okay, thank you. Um, it's really hard for me to hear these stories. It always is. Um, I came here 10 years ago from the United States, uh, I want to give a one-minute background um, before uh, going into this. So, Tzvika, if you can keep me on track so I don't go over. Um, I was an advisor to, uh, to the chairman of the Knesset Social Welfare Lobby. Uh, my whole life I've been working with at-risk kids in, in various professional uh, positions. Um, I consulted with the director of the Department of Children and Family Services to renovate the child welfare system in the Chicago area. 14 million people. We brought from being one of the lowest uh, in the U United States to number one in the country and brought the United States uh, child welfare system from at, towards the bottom of the OECD towards the top. Um, and I'm not saying any of this to brag. Right now, uh, my organization, uh, like CCF, is, uh, uh, has special consultative status with the uh, UN. And um, I thought when I would uh, uh, go for divorce that the social workers that were appointed to our, our case would understand that I'm not just um, somebody who, who speaks from, from the air or ignorance about uh, child welfare. When I, when I filed for divorce because my ex was abusing my children, that these things would matter to the social workers. Instead, it worked against me. In other words, I would have been better off being a plumber or, or a taxi driver who who didn't have the experience that I had. The more the more, uh, uh, yeah, that's that was exactly it. That that made me more of an enemy. And they they told me they they were lying in court. They would testify to the judge lie after lie after lie. They would lie to me in, in the meetings. I got to a point where I would record the, the meetings that I would have with these social workers and their psychiatrists and their psychologists, et cetera, et cetera, um, to document the lies that they were telling. Um, I found by 2010 that that got me nowhere. Um, I found that this system was, was thoroughly corrupt. And um, uh, that's when I decided that it was time to turn to the system that I knew, the, uh, the court systems in the United States that I've been familiar with most of my life. Again, I said that I'd been working in child welfare, so I've been dealing with family courts in the United States, social workers in the United States, and I understood how those court systems worked. So 2010, I told the social workers, I'm going to expose you, and I'm going to turn to the American courts. They thought that was a lie. By the way, um, I think Sion was saying, stay strong. Okay, the social workers were telling me for two years at that point, everybody understands that the system here works wonderfully. It's wonderful here. You are the only one who thinks there's a problem. And I heard that for two years. And I knew that the, the, there was a difference between night and day with what I was seeing here in the, the system here and what I saw in the United States. And one last thing I have to emphasize I've seen, I've been around the world, I've seen a lot of parents. Israeli parents are the best in the world. All right. I've seen them play with children in the parks. I see how Israeli parents raise their children. They're the best in the world. There's no excuse why Israel is, performs the worst in child welfare in the OECD. Not one, one excuse for that. What you see on the streets, we should be number one in the world. And that bothers me. And so I had to turn to, to the American court system to, to sue them. Filed my first lawsuit against them in 2011. Um, at the same time, I took all of those recordings that I told you about. By the way, advice that I have for you, every, every time you talk to a social worker, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, uh, any official in this country, 
put a recorder in your pocket and record it. All right? The only way the truth gets documented. I, I made a, a, a YouTube channel called The Unpromised Land um, where I broadcast their lies out there in, in, in a sarcastic way, used that in evidence in, in court. Uh, we sued uh, Moshe Kahlon, who was the Minister of, of Welfare at the time. Um, who was the Minister of Justice? No, no, it was before Livni. It was before Livni. Naman, yes. Uh, right. Yeah, so, so uh, we went with uh, Simona Steinmetz on down to, to my Piquet Azad. All right? Now, uh, we, we were a grassroots effort to do this. Cost us $350 to file this lawsuit. That's 1,000 shekels it cost us. Cost me uh, to file the first one. Okay? I'm just standing here because it's so good to be with someone famous like you. <laughs> and again, don't put a target on my head. I'm not the, uh, the point here is that there's not any one of us as the superstar, and we should not have that mentality. We should have a grassroots mentality. Because they come, and I've been arrested a number of times. I was just arrested a couple weeks ago. I had three warrants for my arrest, cleared off two of them. As, as I stand here, there's still a warrant out for my arrest. Thankfully, there's not any police in the room right now to arrest me. Okay. Um, they, they might be. Um, so at any rate, they cut my head off. We need five more heads out there. So this has got to be a grassroots mentality, not, not, not a me mentality. At any rate, it cost me $350 to file my first federal lawsuit for what was it, $20 million uh, against uh, Revacha. They had to hire uh, Arnold and Porter, as you may have heard on the news. They, they, they retain them at $1,000 an hour. They have to pay a $100,000 retainer to hire them. So for every dollar I spend, they have to spend 100 or more uh, to defend me, uh, against me. Um, I also sued their American supporters. So you named some of these defendants. Witzel, Namat, uh, New Israel Fund. Schusterman. Uh, Schusterman's not that mine. That's, that's hers. Um, so these, these supporters uh, of, of, the, of what's happening to you, the financial backers, that's $3 billion a year that they raise in the United States. It's a lot of profit they make off of you. All right. You are very lucrative for them. And of taking your children away from, and, and I'm sorry, Mary Gold is not paranoid here. This started with the Yemenite children in the 1950s. And, and, and it hasn't stopped. It's going on and on and on. And so we hit them in the pocketbooks with these. Now. Uh, one of the uh, organizations I sued lost 25%, it was $25 million in donations to them. Do you think some heads might have rolled in that, that organization? Okay. A, a lot of heads rolled in, in Revacha. They appointed uh, uh, Yossi Silman uh, uh, to replace whoever was there before. We, we put pressure on them with just the first lawsuit that we lost, and we lost it. All right, the first three lawsuits I filed, we lost. But that was my learning curve. I've started to win these lawsuits. All right, um, one example is I, I sued a Siwa Mishpati lawyer. Okay. I won. I won. And, and I turned to Siwa Mishpati and said, I'm sorry, I'm destitute. I can't collect this debt. Could you give me... Appoint a lawyer for me to collect this debt against this Siwa Mishpati lawyer. I did it as, as a sort of a being sarcastic. No. They, they gave me one. All right? So, yeah. David, can I just focus the time? Can you just tell people about your Atzala poll and what the result is of those nice Roshams right. So... Here's the thing is I'm doing this piece by piece. Believe you me, I know, just like you know, Piki Dat Saad is evil, and they are enemy number one. I understand that. I get it. We're doing this strategically a little bit at a time. Right now, a group of us headed by Dotan Newman here We, we have filed a lawsuit against Hotsala Poal for $1 billion in New York. He's spearheading this. He's 
a brilliant man. There's another person in this room, by the way, some of you have seen that my English improved dramatically uh, overnight. And I, but thanks, thanks to that person, my Hebrew has improved quite a bit. Give us the bottom line of uh, So at any rate, um, uh, we are uh, trying to turn this into a class action lawsuit representing 80,000 divorced fathers in Hotzala Poal. Um, we'd like to recruit a couple more. You American citizens, talk to the two of us before we leave tonight. We're suing them uh, under what's called the Racketeering Influence Corruption um, Corrupt Organizations Act. That's, uh, that's saying that they're a mafia. Somebody come? Tell us what happened to the uh, judges and the five people. Just so um, so we're, we're, we're saying that the Ministry of Welfare and the Ministry of Justice, those, it, it's a big mafia, and they, they run an extortion tactic um, against us. Now, um, those who want to join us in that, what's that? It's, it, that would fall under the, the, the Ministry of Justice. Um, I want to say from experience, winning some of these lawsuits and losing some, uh, some of these lawsuits, I would encourage each person in this room, um, use the U.S. legal system to, uh, to get justice. They can't stand it. Daphna Hacker has written a couple of articles against me on this already, so we know it gets under their skin. Um, there's two systems in, in the United States, and I'll be happy to help consult. With, with people. There's local courts and there's federal courts. I'm having a much better success rate in the local courts. And I would suggest that if you're going to do a federal lawsuit, that we do them as groups and you do it, you do it in a more organized manner, not just, just throwing something out there because you can, you can actually harm the other people. And it's I'm important. Be rude. I have to grab it. Hang on a sec. He had, you know how we said you have to just annoy the system a little bit. Oh, please, David, tell me how you and Michael and Daron and a couple of others annoyed your judges, will use the word, in the Atzala poll, please, because I should have been a witness last week. Oh, uh, can okay. you just tell us the result of your lawsuit so far? Actually, this is an excellent point of what I'm talking about here. Um, each one of us sued our Rishemot. You know what a Rishemot is, I'm sure. Most, how many people have been in Hotzala Poal here? Okay, so I don't have to tell you what a Rashemit is. A judge. All right. A, a pseudo judge, not, not a real judge. So, uh, so, so yes, we, each of us filed, actually, some of us filed requests to have our uh, registrars, the Rashemit, removed from each of our cases because it's a conflict of interest. We're suing them personally in New York for a billion dollars. How can they objectively continue to handle our files? Okay. Mm -hmm. Dotan, one second. Dotan, what's that? Oh, it, it's okay because because we can do amended complaints, and so if the next one comes in, we can sue them too if they if they're if they're at all unfair to us. So that's not a problem. David, we're running out of time. Uh, okay, so um, out of five of us, four four of the Rishamot rec recused themselves from the files. Uh, he spearheaded that. I think yours just left without. Just left no, no, no. Michael. Michael's okay. Michael, Michael didn't. Need, one of us didn't need to even request. She just left. <laughs> Names of the. Okay, I've got to grab the mic from you, honey. Okay. Uh, what I want to ask everybody here with CCF, he's amazing. Um, we need you if you want to sue from the states. You can do a little one, little one. You know that it takes two minutes online. Hold on, hold on. Little one. No, you could do million-dollar lawsuits in a local court. Okay, when we say little... But we also mean a few thousand dollars just to annoy. Yeah, but I mean, in other words, for about the same price to file the... the yeah, do a bill, you could do a billion one in a local court, or you could do it in federal court. I'm trying to encourage you to avoid the federal court if you're going to do it by yourself and you're not quite sure what you're doing. Do it in the local court. I'm going to cut you for a minute. Okay. 
Right. Yes, Listen, Motti has kindly <laughs> allowed us to run over a little bit on his Kenneth, and I'm really grateful. Thank you for that, because he's going to talk more in Hebrew. Listen to, listen to this. Right now, this has been filmed for the UN, okay? The UN, we are a civil society. We can't do everything through the UN because they're not a, a court, but we can do it through the states, and we can annoy, we can pester, and we can scare. Mm -hmm. And David knows how to do it. So how many of you would like to consider making a lawsuit in the states? Yeah, a few of you? Okay. Real quick, anybody who wants to join a Hotsalo Poal case with us, we're, doing it, we're wrapping it up tonight. So talk to us afterwards. If you want to do your own individual lawsuit on something else, uh, I'll talk to you about how to do it in a local court instead of a federal court. The civil society, we have been writing letters for you. We wrote for somebody who's sitting behind a camera this week. We've written for a hero that's over there. Uh, four times in a week and finally we're getting answers from the rapporteurs now we've had videos made as well for your torture and we're sending constantly letters videos and evidence to the UN to invite them in I want them back we did get them in five years ago okay in 2011 when Mr. Zare started Mr. V Zare who is my hero um, started CCF it was the very first time we went abroad and it shocked the UN so much that they came in and asked questions and then they rounded everyone up and arrested them but they came in and we're trying to get them back and I will bring them back if it's the last thing I do they will come back and they will see you now I'm sorry you've got to wait we've got to move on because I've got the timekeeper looking at me in a funny way um, the right of the child let's just talk about the child the UNCRC every child has a right to be raised by his blood relations Every parent has a right to raise his child. That is the right of the child. If a child is going to be adopted, it takes 12 months, according to the UNCRC, and with full permission of both parents, if there are. All the rights of the child have been broken in Israel, all of them. Why? Because there's no ombudsman. There's no one here for the children. You can only go to Shapira, who is the children's ombudsman. Yosef Shapira is protecting your children. Whoa, isn't that great? Are you brave? Do you feel brave? Are you brave? Not you, you're big. Are you little boy brave? Come with me. The right of the child in Israel is not held. You can't take pictures of your children unless you're living with them and it's their birthday. You can't do anything with children if the social workers tell you that you can't. However, Ma, Anila Mavina Amila. The mother is standing here, and if this was his bar mitzvah, and we were making a video, sorry, I'm going to stop you. If this was a bar mitzvah, and he was standing here, and everybody was at his party, he would be able to say, thank you to everybody for my bar mitzvah. That is okay, yeah? Now, his mother's standing here, and he has the right as a child of the age of 13 passing his bar mitzvah to speak. It is his right, and no one is going to stop this child from speaking because it is right. It is the law that says he can. There's no law that says he can't, and not in my world. 13-year-olds can say whatever they like. Right. Now, I'm just going to stress this again that children are shown on Facebook having baths, riding horses, having donkeys, eating cake. Everyone shows their kids every weekend doing whatever they want to do. This child is standing with his mother, this young 13-year-old boy, and he came all the way from Jerusalem because he wants to tell the UN what it's like to be a child in an emergency center. I think he has the right, don't you? Yeah. 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 I also think this mother is incredible because she got her kid back. Uh, I need someone who knows how to use a discount key in my computer because we want to show some happy family pictures. Somebody help me. Um, I know you're upset about this, some people, but is anyone telling me a kid can't speak? Great. Off you go. Do you want to hold the mic and help him with this because you know his story? Do you want to hold the mic? Now, Yael is South African, okay? And obviously, you're a little bit of both. Come over here. Come over here. And your name is? Orel. My name is Orel. 
Okay, Aurel, and I understand that you were taken to an emergency centre, am I right? Yes. Okay, so do you want to tell everybody what it was like inside there? Well, it wasn't fun. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know it wasn't fun. Uh, do you want to try and describe how it felt for you? So, um, I was taken there, and it was just like out of the blue. Uh, one night they told me I was going, and the second day I was in a taxi going there. So they took me there, and when I, once I was there, um, I met my new house mother and everything. And after a few days, like, they let me go out of the house in there. And I met other kids, and the kids were, like, for a couple of days were nice, and then they started being abusive. And so were the staff. The staff like, at the start, one of the staff members, which is a volunteer, um, uh, hit me, and I fell to the ground, and, like, I started crying because... Her. And then afterwards, like towards the end, another staff member choked me. Which emergency center were you in in Israel? Do you remember where you were? Uh, yeah, in Arad. It's a name called Neradim. Okay. And tell me, could you see your mum all the time or not all the time? Um, only two times a week. What was it like for the other five days? Not fun. Like I was there and I was needed to to be with the other kids and they kept annoying me and bugging me. And what about going to school? Because I understand when you're in an emergency center or you're held, tell me what it was like to go to school. There wasn't really a school. It wasn't even approved by the, um, the you're education. Great. You're doing great, don't worry. You're doing great, he's doing great. It wasn't even approved by them. They were just trying to get it. But I was taught by an 18 year old who basically just taught me math, and that's it. Were you given it a... It was in the place. It was in the place, so I didn't even get to leave. Really? So did you get a judge given to you, or someone to, so that you could tell the court what you wanted? Um, I wasn't really able to tell the court directly. I had to tell uh, someone who would tell the court, like my lawyer. But it wasn't really a good lawyer. She didn't even listen to me, and she said what she thought, not what I thought. I can't do, do you remember? Oh, she'll tell us. So tell me, when you told your lawyer things, are you saying that the lawyer said things that she thought that you wanted to say, not what you actually said? I told her something, and she says that like, okay, I'll tell him that, but I'll tell him like, that's what he thinks. I don't think I think exactly opposite. I don't like she would represent herself basically. Okay, so we know that in Israel the law is, as I still understand it, um, 30 days in an emergency center. Can anyone correct me if that's wrong? It's still 30 days by law to hold a child. 30 days. How long were you in the emergency center for? Um, from July up till Purim. Up until Purim? Nine months in an emergency center. Nine months. Three to six. Three to six is the max. And when did you come home? Was it this year? Uh, yeah. yeah. It was just like, it was per. So um, I'm not going to put words into your mouth because that's not fair. And I want you to tell it exactly as it is. But um, what was the worst, worst thing about being in there? Not being able to be with my mom and my, like, not being able to be at home and going to school and being with my mom. Not, be able to, not being able to live a normal life. Did they tell you why they took you? I kept asking, but they told me that, like, it's not my fault and mommy's fault. And when mommy asked why they took me, they kept telling mommy, it's not her fault, it's my fault. So, like, they were twisting it around. So you never really knew why you were taken. You were just taken one day, and that was that. So you've come out now, and I'm so happy he's free, aren't you? I'm so happy he's free. <laughs> And she fought for this. I met her last year, and I told her, the only hero that any child has in their life is their parent. That is the hero. The hero is the parent. And she fought for you, didn't she? Yeah. Tell me, what's it like to be home now? Does it feel strange? Um, a little bit, but I'm like, like um, I've, it's way better than being there. And I like being home, and it's fun. I'm living a normal life again. What was the food like? <laughs> they, didn't, what was the, they didn't give you anything extra over the food, did they? Um, no, but it was like actual cooking. The food was okay, just not like, they didn't give us any extra, but food. 
No, no medication, no pills. Um, no. Oh, she told him, don't. If the food tastes funny, don't eat it. If you could put something in your mouth, spit it out. He got all the rules from his uh, heroic mother. You are amazing, um, and it's because of you and because of children like you that we are going to fight for the rights of the children of Israel. You are such a hero. I'm so proud of you. Isn't he great? Thank you. Do you want to sit down? Yael, do you want to say anything? <laughs> okay. You can go sit down, this sweetheart. Good boy. Wow, what a kid, huh? Um, oh, that's what happened. Just talking. Yes. Okay, so, okay. So, uh, as you heard from, uh, my name's Yael. I'm an Israeli citizen. I grew up in South Africa, but lost my South African citizenship by leaving the country. Uh, I've... It's okay. <laughs> um, I've uh, lived in Israel most of my life. Uh, I finished high school here, I got married here, and I have four children. I'm a mother of 27 years. Orel is my baby, um, the last one that lives at home. Um, when he was put into the emergency... I've been given a five-minute warning, so okay. I want you to concentrate for me. Just tell people here, how did you get him back? I basically went to war with the Ravacha. Um, uh, I fought with the River Ha. I kept getting into trouble with the police because Orel was brave enough to leave where he was being abused and was able to make his way home. And when the whole police force were looking for him for 12 hours and they found him asleep in my bed after I'd, I found him full of mud and I hadn't called them yet to let them know we found him, I got arrested um, for kidnapping. <laughs> Uh, the police broke into the house. Okay, they broke into the house. Uh, they demanded I give them the child. I said, but he just fell asleep. He's been in the rain and the, in the mud for 12 hours. I, I didn't call you because I gave him a hot bath and some hot chocolate, and I just snuggled him till he went to bed. And I fell asleep because we were. Got to keep you focused. Okay, so um, uh, what, what, then what was the question? Again? I want to know the final thing that got him out of the emergency centre, please. Uh, the final thing was firing my lawyer from Siwa Mishpati and representing myself. <laughs> the lawyer from Siwa Mishpati refused to give documentation, tapes of proof of what a good mother I am. I had a teacher that was witness to three years of educating my son who said that I was the best mother in his class. They had no reason to take my child. We were in financial difficulties and they went in and lied about the reasons they took him. I had all the proof to show them because I'm very organized. I'm a, I, I run a nationwide organization. I love her, but we are so running out of time. Uh, if anyone wants to know what she did, and we will, I have videoed her, we do have a story, but just, hey, she got her kid back here. Okay, we're wrapping up, we're wrapping up because uh, time's moving on and, and yeah, it was late night. There's two more really important people to speak. Uh, hello, you're so nervous, aren't you? Uh, the rights of the child, we're still talking about human rights violations here. Yaniv is going to close the show for us and talk about the appalling, <laughs> well just, God, how many human rights violations can you cover in five minutes, Yaniv? And you're going to talk about the no exit, yeah? The no exit order, let me just tell you, and I will, I'm just going to introduce this. Do you know that it's only Israel that does this? You're born to a no exit order. You just wait for the day it's going to come on you. You do not know that you're born in prison. That's why the, the people here are fighting harder, because they weren't born in a jail. So listen to the foreign citizens. They know what they're doing. They're fighting because they were born free. Go for it. Thank you. Hi. A state of <laughs> a stay of a exit order and damages to the human rights. Is it possible to issue state of exit order in the execution office without outstanding Beth? The answer to this is yes. Stay of exit orders are very often issued during divorce proceeding or after a couple has divorced. During divorce pr process, in concern exists that one of the spouses 
may run away from the country and turn the other spouse into a gun or a guna, there exists the op option to issue stay of exit order. Even more so when a spouses are already divorced and the purpose is to prevent one spouse from leaving the country due to concerns that alimony or child support payment will not be paid or to prevent the exit of the children from the country when it is feared they will not return. The order is issued <coughs> at the request of one of parties in the divorce process and involves much more than simply depositing the passport and closing the borders. It involves a definite restriction of a person's right to move freely. Take for example a parent that does not permanently live in Israel and wants his child to come visit him. If a stay of exit order was issued against the children, obviously without the children's control, since they are minors, he may not see them for a very long time. A stay of exit order of minors is a, is a common, yet explosive order. Sometimes one spouse uses the children in a order to hurt the other, preventing one of party parties from seeing his or her children may cause significant distance, emotional and physical, from the children. A parent who will try to take his children out of the country without the permission of the other party, even prior to the signing of the divorce agreement, may be blamed for intentionally sabotaging the agreement the parties made. Stay of exit orders are issued ba based on lack of agreement between the spouses. A judge may even issue an order that is only based on an argument. For example, when one of the parties said that he may or not pay child support for various reasons, a woman may argue before the court that there is a tiny debt of 10 shekels and until it is not proved otherwise, and even if she knows this is not true, there will be issued standing stay of exit order for her ex-husband. This, of course, may hurt his livelihood, the money he earns to pay alimony, and leaves him penniless with while he is uh, still obligated to pay child support. A stay of exit order is valid for one year and can be renewed. In an alimony case, there is no limit on order period. The, the spouses that, wa that was affected by the stay of exit order may petition the court and suggest why he thinks the court order is wrong. In some cases, the court may allow him exit under restriction condi conditions, like a hefty bond, and when his return can be guaranteed. This bond, sometimes up to thousands of thousands of shekels, is deposited at the time of his departure from the country and refunded upon his return. In addition, the court will demand the guarantee of the third party and such guarantee will be removed upon the debtor's uh, returns to the country. During the time the debtor is abroad, the guarantor will be prohibited from exiti ex exiting the country in his place. I will give an example of a stay of exit order that was issued in Israel. A divorced person came to me for consolation. He works uh, for a high-tech company in Israel, and his managers are in the USA. His family members also live in the US, while his wife is Israeli, and he chose to do aliyah for her. His ex-wife decided that he didn't pay his half of unusual expense. In this case, 100 shekels, the amount he should have paid for the after-school activity of one of the children, one of the children. The wife quickly and easily opened an execution file in which she 
is not only demanded the 100 shekels he owes her, but also claimed she worries for the next year's child support payments, an option given to her by the Israeli law. You should understand the execution proceeding is tedious, exhausting, and expensive. First, the husband has to file motion to cancel the order in the execution office. If his motion is denied, then he has to file an appeal to the family court. Yes, I, be I believe that in a situation when human rights are being violated, a bit of compassion will lead to a more just result, especially in cases in which a father is paying child support regularly and finds himself in complex and threatening legal chaos in which he has a slim chance to defend his basic rights. Okay, right, you know what? You can never end a CCF event. It's ending, it's ending. Don't go yet, don't leave yet. This is the best bit. Yaniv Moyal, as the chairman of CCF, has got to finish this off for two seconds. With a microphone, please. With a mic. With a microphone, please. This is two seconds. You, you can leave if you want, but he has to finish as the chairman of CCF. I'll, I'll, I'll finish it very short about, in, in English about what uh, my view about what's happening and why is it happening, and I hope that uh, it will uh, help people see it my, my way. Um, there is a saying in Hebrew that the road to hell is full with good intentions. And... Um, we talked here about the right of the child, and I would like to drop a bomb here. And I think that the right of a child is basically a slogan in order to take the right of the parents away. Basically, if you said the child have his own rights, you said, okay, who's going to decide what's the right of the child? And they said, the judge will, not the parents, the judge. And then that, that's the way you take the parents right away. So what happens uh, that brought us to, to the point that we are today? Few things. First, the 1989 uh, Convention of the Right of the Child. That's basically a move from the uh, right of the parents, like I said, to the right of the child. Basically, it's, it's, it, it, they fool us to believe that this is a way to give rights to children like they are their own person. The best interest of the child is not how the parents view it, it's how a judge or the country or the state see it. Um, the feminist movement, the feminist movement and especially the feminist nationalist movement like Vizzo and Naamat, all those organizations control the revacha, the social welfare, controlled the institutions, basically took uh, um, um, a privatized uh, uh, institution that used to be government institutions and put a profit as a factor in it. Now when you have a profit and you have kids, you got corruptions and you got kids trafficking. And that's what's happening. Um, just a system that based on, not on fact-finding, and just a system based on agenda. If you have an agenda, you basically in 1995 we created the uh, family court, which is not a family court, it's a feminine court. It's a court that was supposed to contra uh, co contradict the, uh, the rabbinical court that men used to have more power there. So they said, okay, we'll create a feminine court, which uh, will be the family court, and there we'll give an advantage to the woman. They're going to be women judges, going to be women social welfare. And you've got to stop. And I've got to stop. <laughs> it's basically, basically, when you put all this together, you get what we get today, a human rights violation in a massive scale. That's basically it. Listen, hey, thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm so pre Thank you for having me in Israel. I'm leaving next week. I'll take you all with me. I'll do my best for you. Thank you so much.